Teased at Christmas 2020, Patty Jenkins' Rogue Squadron film was going to focus on... Rogue Squadron. The best of the best hotshot pilots in the Alliance fleet. These are the guys who blew up two Death Stars. These are the guys who looped the cables around the Atat's legs in Empire Strikes Back. They are the best. If the name Rogue Squadron rings a bell, then... I'm gonna guess it's because of the GameCube or maybe even the N64 games. But the name Rogue Squadron appeared much earlier in the EU. The Rogues had comics and novels before they ever got their own computer games. Jenkins said that her film was going to reference these old games and books and comics and stuff to channel that into the greatest fighter pilot movie of all time. After a troubled development, the first ever Star Wars film to be directed by a lady was officially cancelled by Disney on International Women's Day 2023. That aside, this left a gap in my mind as to what Jenkins' vision for this film would have looked like. And the film should actually have been out by now, so in order to get a fix, I turned back to my old Dark Horse comic books and I guess in a way hoping that what I read there might have shed some light onto what we could have expected from the Rogue Squadron film. Dark Horse published the X-Wing comic books from July 1995 to November 1998. It's one big ongoing story, it's 35 issues long, and it's broken down into nine fairly distinct arcs. The whole thing was overseen by Michael Stackpole. Stackpole came up as an RPG designer and writer, and he wrote loads of games. In fact, there is almost no chance you haven't heard of at least one game that Stackpole wrote. In the late 80s and early 90s, he started to dabble in writing novels. He really started out writing novels based in the universes that he was already used to, based in licensed IPs where the groundwork had already been done, where the universes had already been built. With the world building already done, Stackpole was basically free to explore this world from a running start. Stackpole hadn't written comics before he wrote these, so Dark Horse, in a bit of a smart move actually, what they did is they paired him up with more experienced comic book writers, so again, he was free just to be something of an ideas guy. I like to imagine him as basically like a Barbara Cartland-like character, like stretched out on his chaise long, just dictating all of his cool ideas for X-Wing comics. I'm obviously conjecturing here, but really what I imagine happened is Stackpole would have written like treatments, maybe like screenplays for these comics, and then handed them over to more experienced writers who would have turned them into more comic appropriate scripts. The comics are set in the year between Return of the Jedi and the EU novel Heir to the Empire. The death of the Emperor has shattered the Empire into innumerable little shards. Without the Emperor as the power centre holding all of this together, the whole empire just fractures apart and all these little warlords start springing up all over the place, declaring themselves as admirals or princes, claiming that they are the true heir to Palpatine's throne. There is constant bloodshed as all of these different principalities and fiefdoms rise and fall, they absorb each other, they implode under civil war. It is a really dangerous time for the galaxy. It is possible that this story and setting was inspired by real-life events. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 triggered a wave of wars of independence. We saw countries across Africa throwing off the shackles of colonialism and oppression, fighting for sovereignty in the wake of dying empires. What I really enjoy about X-Wing is that it makes a point of not being one of those top-level kind of Greek myth style stories about great epic heroes and villains. It instead chooses to tell a story about the boots on the ground. The intention was always to tell this grittier military drama set in the Star Wars universe. There's no lightsabers, there's no force powers. X-Wing spends more time 
talking about being a soldier. It focuses on those who are active participants in and direct victims of war. It really spends time paying attention to the death and the suffering of the little people. It spends a lot of time sitting in that. This is ahead of things like Black Hawk Down or Band of Brothers, and I don't think the comic actually reaches that level, but it certainly aspires to. The comics reintroduce us to characters from the films like Wedge Antilles, Ewan McGregor's uncle from the original trilogy, you know? Wes Jansen, Hobby Clivian, but also introduce us to new long-standing characters like Tycho Kelchu, Claw Lowe, Dillar Nepp, <laughs> and Elskol Lauro. Each arc has something that needs to be blown up or something that needs to be stolen or some people who need to be rescued there's generally a MacGuffin that needs to be done there aren't really any huge stakes but there are some really interesting character moments and there's some really great explosive action which uses the linear storytelling format really really well and now I'm going to actually talk about each arc of the comic book, so there are going to be mild spoilers. I'm not going to give away any major plot events, but I am going to have to talk about kind of the setup for the arc and kind of the reason the rogues are there. So take that as your warning. There will be mild spoilers. The comic's like 20 years old. <coughs> that was well timed. The first ever X-Wing story wasn't actually ever collected by Dark Horse, which is weird because it's a really great book. The story opens up with the Rebels being intercepted as they're trying to run supplies above the planet Silpa. Wes Jansen gets shot down in a dogfight and then one of our newer characters, Tycho, sets out to go and find him. At the same time, Wedge Antilles attempts to contact the locals to try to figure out what's going on. We get that big bombastic opening with spaceships and laser guns, brilliant, but then the story sufficiently slows down so that it can introduce us, or in some cases reintroduce us, to the principal cast. Tycho and Wes end up taking refuge in a cave, which I think is just one of these classic sci-fi desert island stories, brilliant stuff. It could only really be better if they were on like separate sides and then, you'd, then the circle would really be complete. At the same time though, Wedge then bumps into the Silpari resistance and we're given this much bigger picture of what's going on. So it turns out the Silpari people are actually already fighting and pushing off their Imperial occupiers. But they see the Alliance as just the other side of the same coin. A great opening story, we're shown the toll of the war in very real terms. The book shows us demolished homes, broken families, in a way that the films never really had enough time to tell. The rebel opposition, to me, feels very much like a story that was inspired by the Gulf War. Just a few years earlier, we had watched US-led coalition forces liberate Kuwait and some of Iraq. The news showed us the devastation experienced by those caught between these two warring factions. Normal people who just want to live their lives and would just rather everybody just left them alone. And that's what the rebel opposition is about. There is a great pace to the story. We cut back and forth between bombastic combat sequences and these nice slower character beats. For the first ever Rogue Squadron story, there's loads of stuff here. We've got intrigue, we've got some twists, some friends become enemies, some enemies become friends. As an opening salvo, this is exactly the kind of thing that I would want to see in an X-Wing film. It's got great intrigue, it's got these great humanist tones. It's very Rogue One-ish, actually. And actually, it's very Patty Jenkins-ish. The Phantom Affair hits hard. The rogues find themselves on the planet Mrlust. 
they've heard about the phantom ship which is this ship which is supposedly fitted with a cloaking device and at this point in the star wars continuity cloaking devices were not uh, as prevalent as they are in star trek they are massive pieces of technology that require loads of energy so you can only get them on really big powerful ships that's why there's that line in empire strikes back they can't have disappeared no ship that small has a cloaking device. The idea of one small enough to be fitted onto a transport ship is just too tempting for the Alliance to pass up. The MacGuffin is rarely the most interesting part of the story and it certainly is the least interesting part of this story because Muralist is home to one of the most interesting things I've ever read in the EU and that is a faction of Neo-Empire Endor deniers. The Anti-Endor Association claims that there never was a Battle of Endor. There was no Imperial oppression of the Ewok people. It is all made up lefty propaganda to generate sympathy for the rebel cause. It's fake news to justify terrorism. You can see what the illustrator Edvin Bukovic was going for here with like the uniforms and that, but I think it's a bit more subtle than that. You see, he and the writer of this book, Darko McCann, are both Croatian. They were both living and working in Croatia at the time they were writing this book. So they had lived through five years of civil war as the former Yugoslavia had violently broken apart during the death throes of the Soviet Union. In fact, while this comic was being written, Croatia was still fighting for independence from Yugoslavia. Tremendous war crimes were committed in Yugoslavia during this time period, and a lot of these war crimes were denied in real life, just like the way the Anti-Endor Association are denying the Empire ever committed any war crimes in this page. These two creators had seen war crimes firsthand and they're processing that in the pages of this book. I am struck by how strong this kind of alt-right alternative fact subplot works in this comic 20 years later. It's kind of sad how relevant this still feels, but it's also great to read a book of this age and go, yeah, this would actually make a really good film. You, of course, you'd always get those guys in the basement complaining how they made Star Wars woke but mate wake up it was always woke this would make a brilliant film In Battleground Tatooine, the rogues head back to Tatooine. Because of course they do. You can't do a Star Wars story without going back to Tatooine, right? I mean, the incredible irony of it being the one planet that's furthest from the galaxy's bright, shiny center. So after Leia kills Jabba at the end of Return of the Jedi, what we're told is this leaves a huge power vacuum in the Tatooine underworld. All these wannabe gangsters and crime bosses come out of the woodwork and they're trying to gobble up what's left of Jabba's empire. They're kind of rising and falling and pulling everything apart. You can see what they're doing here. It's, it's layers. As well as that though, apparently there's this big cache of all this smuggler treasure that's buried somewhere out in the sand, you know, guns, weapons, ammo, dresses with pockets, everything a girl could dream of. So the rogues are then dispatched to infiltrate the underworld and to find all the stuff. It is far more action forward. There's not nearly as much kind of political intrigue as the previous two arcs. And although they do bump into the Imperial Remnant, it's actually really fun to see the rogues doing something like this. It's way less kind of military led. It's much more of a more kind of commando mission, kind of a dirty dozen behind enemy lines kind of vibe. I really like this and the book has generally a more upbeat tone than the previous two arcs. It is far more action adventure -y. It feels like a Star Wars film that would be made by Stephen Sommers, which until saying those words, I didn't realize how badly I wanted that.
I think we can see here that Stackpole and Dark Horse were really settling into what Rogue Squadron was going to be all about. And they start to try some interesting new things in the universe. So in The Warrior Princess, Rogue Squadron pilot Plural Low is called home to her home planet of Iatu 6. It turns out that Plaw has been hiding the fact that she is actually the princess of Iatu and she's heir to the throne. Plaw is asked to come home to reunite all the warring factions of Iatu who have broken down into civil war. She doesn't want to go home because she doesn't believe in the monarchy. She doesn't believe in the divine right to rule. But at the end of the day, people are dying. And what adds more drama to this is the Empire are just cotching on the edge of the system that Iatu's part of, and they're just waiting to see who wins the war before they themselves just swoop in and hoover up whatever resources are left. It's another story that has these same shades of civil war thread throughout, which is very common for the kinds of stories we've seen here. But the extra added drama of having this foreign overpowered like military presence who are just watching a civil war so that they can swoop in and and hoover up all those resources i think adds a really interesting new layer to the story and much like previous ones i can't help but feel that this has some real world inspirations i'm getting shades of all those resource misappropriation stories that we saw in the wake of the iraq war and also, some very similar things are happening in the world today. The Warrior Princess is another story that focuses more on intrigue and politics than it does on spaceships and laser guns. And the fact that this one focuses a little bit more on women in power and the machinations of the patriarchy, I think this would make a really good Patty Jenkins film. Requiem for a Rogue has the setup of an episode of a 90s TV show. The rogues need to go down onto the planet Malrev 4 because they're looking for a crashed ship that has some lost bothans on it. It turns out that Malrev 4 has been taken over by an upstart Sith Lord who's been stuck here since the fall of the Empire. He has enslaved the native inhabitants to be mindless automatons in his army and he wants to do the same to anybody who stays on this planet for long enough. This is the first story where a member of the principal cast dies. We've spent 20 issues now growing with these characters, getting used to them being around and the pain that we feel when one of them is taken from us is real. From this point on, this becomes really common. Stackpole does not shy away from killing off main characters, and honestly, this is great. These first four arcs were formative in setting up the world of Rogue Squadron. Stackpile was getting used to working with the Dark Horse team, he's exploring the possibilities of the space and establishing his characters. While I don't think that this story particularly is a ripe candidate to inspire a film, Stackpile was clearly feeling more confident with what he was creating. And from here, he would inject whole new dangers into the comics pushing the rogues to new limits. After 20 issues, Stackpole really seems to have got the hang of writing comics and has got a lot more confidence in what he wants to achieve on this book. So from this point on, he doesn't work with any other writers. It's just him. In the Empire's service was a real turning point for me as a reader, and I think this is entirely down to this newfound confidence from Stackpole. I really enjoyed the previous arcs. I liked how they were, I think, clearly inspired by real-world events. I liked how the writers and creators on that book were channeling their real-life experiences into the stories. But once Stackpole establishes that these characters can actually die, 
The drama is ramped up no end and he starts building way bigger stakes in the book and starts drawing much wider narrative strokes. His first act as sole writer is to establish a hierarchy of persistent villains for the rogues. First, he introduces Sate Pestage. Pestage was the Emperor's highest ranking advisor and he is actually the de facto successor to the Emperor. Pestage is shown to be in an awkward position. He's trying to balance the Imperial Remnant, trying to quell all the infighting within it, all without the Emperor's will or charisma. He's leaning a lot on his head of intelligence, Izan Izard. As I previously mentioned, Stackpole was writing the comics and the books concurrently. He had actually already introduced Izard in the novels. She's like the main villain for the first four books. Uh, but the comics are set a little bit earlier than the book. So this is like Izard's rise to power. Straight away, we're shown just how much Pestage relies on Izard. Her strategic and tactical thinking helped to keep those local systems in line and helps to balance the power throughout the Empire. It would be a shame if the woman he trusted the most in the galaxy would be working under her own agenda. In the Empire service is set largely around a planned battle for the planet Brental IV. Brental is a powerful planet. It is inhabited by the richest and the most decadent members of the Imperial elite. It is ruled over by an equally decadent and ineffectual Admiral Izoto. Izoto whiles away his days lounging about like a Roman. Food, wine, women. Nado even draws him with the Caesar haircut. To bolster Brentol's defences, Pestage deploys the 181st TIE Fighter Squadron. And with them come Rogue Squadron's first true enemy, Baron Suntir Fell. Apparently it was Dark Horse editor Pete James's idea to come up with this idea of like an Imperial equivalent to Wedge Antilles. Previous arcs had tried to set up villains for the Rogues, but nothing really stuck. In Fell, Stackpole is setting up a long-term villain for the Rogues, and this rocks. Obviously inspired by the real-world Red Baron, Fell is a hot Imperial fighter ace, and the 181st are basically his version of Rogue Squadron. I really like the machinations in this book. Izoto, Pestige, and even Fell are shown just to be pawns in Izard's little game. The way that she plays Pestige against the other Imperial Command is really cool. She knows Izoto is madly ineffectual. She knows he's going to lose that planet, but she advises Pestage to keep him there, saying that, no, 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 he's a good choice, trust me on this. And then she turns to like the Provisional Council and says, I tried telling Pestage not to leave Izoto there, but he insisted. So like she's playing all these dangerous games and it adds so much depth to a villain instead of giving us just this more kind of moustache twirling baddie that we've seen elsewhere. In the Empire Service also gives us uh, another more intimate look into the horrors of war and this time it's thrown into relief by all the debauchery of Izoto and Brentol's mega rich. Fell sees all this decadence and he hates it. This is not his empire. This is not the empire that he fought for. And this comes into play a little bit later on. This is pretty much exactly the Rogue Squadron film that I would want. The machinations, the backstabbing, all of the kind of Game of Thrones style politics. I just think it's so much more intriguing and so much more interesting than just spaceships and pew 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 pew. Although that has value, I think this adds a lot more depth to something which could be a little too simple. Family Ties is a much shorter arc which follows directly on from the events of In the Empire's Service. The trade paperback also collects the double size one shot The Making of Baron Fell which gives us a much more comprehensive backstory for Fell, and that's what I'll talk about first, 
because that gives a little more context in the story which is still to come. Fel is from Corellia. That's Han Solo's home planet and that's also Wedge Antilles' home planet. And what's great here is we're shown that Fel basically had the same upbringing as Wedge Antilles. It's actually great to show these two diametrically opposed characters have the same home, they had the same career. The comics showed us Wedge's defection from the Imperial Academy and him joining the Rebel Alliance, but now we see Fel's backstory too, and it's surprisingly similar. What I think's great about this is we're shown that two people from pretty much the same background with pretty much the same experiences can still go down completely different trouser legs in life. We're shown all the events which Fell and Antilles were present for, but this time we're shown Fell's pride of being on the Empire's side. The one shot leads directly into family ties. Fell has seen the Empire's rot and corruption firsthand at Brentol. And now his wife, Ciel, has gone missing, and he suspects this is part of one of Izard's plots. So he approaches Wedge and Rogue Squadron, and he gives them an offer they can't refuse, provided the rogues help him get his wife back. What we're then treated to is something of a gumshoe detective story, as a small band of rogues infiltrate the Corellian underworld, sleuthing about, gathering clues, trying to uncover the mystery of Sial Fell's disappearance. There's twists, there's turns, there's a few good fights, there's even a couple of car chases and a big explosive finale. I'm really trying not to give away story spoilers here, but these last two arcs are a really good read. I really feel that this has the vibe of one of those slow-burning two-parters halfway through a TV show season, you know, where you get the mid-season finale. It really has that kind of feel. The latter end of these Rogue Squadron comics really work to set up much longer plays rather than the self-contained arcs we'd seen earlier on. Stackpole now is basically building his own world rather than working within the constraints of somebody else's. We're also at a point now where I think these stories are really starting to work way better as comics. I'm not entirely sure that Family Ties would make that good a film, but the overall tone and some of the themes we're seeing emerging here would be awesome as part of something cinematic. Pestage is shrewd enough to sense the heat coming around the corner. He knows the game is afoot, but he realises a little bit too late to be able to do anything about it. So he starts considering his options. Basically, he wants to defect to the Alliance before he ends up getting a knife between the ribs. Not only that, but he's willing to offer the keys to Coruscant, the Imperial home planet, to sweeten the deal. Stackpole is flexing his writing muscles here. Of all of the arcs in the Rogue Squadron comic, this one probably has the least amount of time actually spent in X-Wings. There's lots of intrigue, lots of really interesting stuff here. And the events from this lead directly into the next arc, Mandatory Retirement. In her capacity as head of Imperial Intelligence, Izard has figured out that Pestage is defecting. So she puts him on the hit list as a traitor, and he then disappears and goes into hiding. With Pestage gone, there is no Imperial leadership, so like an emergency council is put together. And because Izard is just intelligence, she's immediately cut out of that. So straight away, you see her circumventing them, doing all of her same machinations all over again. Alliance Command recognises the value of Pestage, so they send out Rogue Squadron to bring him in. At the same time, Izard sends out her own special forces to do the same thing. This is the first time in the book we've seen some high stakes, high risk, high reward stuff. There really is some great action here, and it is a far more focused story. We get some real seat of the pants dogfighting, we're given pages upon pages of urban fighting, and sometimes there isn't even any dialogue. It's just this frantic, relentless battle. 
and it really shows the range this comic has. We go from this kind of quite slow burning political stuff and we're thrown into these big crazy fights. When it turns out that it's going to be harder for the rogues to leave the planet with Pestage than they had originally hoped, we start to twig that not everyone is going to be getting out of this one alive. Stackpole had previously shown us that he's quite comfortable with killing off main members of the principal cast. If you were reading this as a monthly comic, you would have been building up a relationship with these characters for three years. Inside the ranks of Rogue Squadron, we've seen rivals become friends. We've seen enemies become lovers. We have seen little romances budding between the members of Rogue Squadron. And when it's time to say goodbye to some of these characters... It really hurts. I was genuinely emotional at the end of this arc. And this is actually the ending of the comic too. And it's so good for a comic series to actually have an ending. So it's a very bittersweet thing. It's great to get the end of a story, but it was also very sad. These latter arcs, as I've mentioned before, are really all about setting up the rise of Izan Izard. She is so much more than just another Mayfly Imperial Admiral. All of these machinations, all of this intrigue and manoeuvring is all part of a much bigger game, with the Imperial Throne as her ultimate prize. There are so many great ideas in these comics that I think would translate really well into a Rogue Squadron film. I think Disney Plus nowadays would be more likely to turn this into a TV series. You could pretty much take every issue of the comic and make that its own self-contained episode. The last three arcs in particular I think would make for a great Rogue Squadron film. I mean there's even technically trilogy potential here. The idea of Baron Fell being this kind of Vader-esque character and then behind him Izard is this kind of Urzat's Emperor. We have the military leader and then we have the political leader. The idea of there being an evil rogue squadron I think is a really compelling one. It is kind of like the bad guys are an evil version of the good guys but this is ever so slightly different so I think that works. I really like the idea of a Top Gun style film but still with all these politics and the intrigue happening outside the cockpit. The just after Endor time period was not explored for a really long time. We're seeing more of that now, which is great, and I would love to see that time period being explored more. The idea that even after the Emperor dies, the Empire is still around. It's still really dangerous. And the idea of like Endor deniers and like right wing pro Empire fringe groups is just so delicious. You'd have to use it. I have a list of things that I'd like to put together into my own pitch video for like how I would pitch the Rogue Squadron film to Disney. If you want to see that, then you know exactly what to do. And if you've got any ideas of your own, I mean, sling them in the comments because if it's really good, I'll put it in my video. I'll happily steal your ideas too. Uh, and if you enjoyed this and you want to see more, I'm going to be doing the same video again, but for the books. So come back for that. And if you like Star Wars EU stuff, stuff from the Y2K era, then hang around because that's pretty much what I love to talk about here on Stoked and I'll hopefully see you in a future video. One final shout out to the channel members. You guys give me a little tip at the end of each month. You are quality mate. I massively appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right, that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Ta-da!